Okay, uh, so good morning. Uh, I hope you had a great uh, spring break, of, along with lots of meetings during spring break. We had a faculty meeting right before the break started, and I was talking to one of my colleagues who shall remain nameless, and I said, I don't assign homework over uh, breaks. And he said, well, I want them to remember me. <laughs> so hopefully your parents called them and not me. Uh, so that being the case, <clears throat> excuse me, today our focus uh, will be to continue with time series. And we're gonna use a specific application for time series data uh, and also learn a little bit of domain information about so-called uh, leading indicators. Okay, <clears throat> but before we begin the usual administrative uh, bits, uh, the reading from last time, I set a due date uh, for the 15th. And again, I don't test on the reading, I treat you like the adults you are, um, but this is just there um, to be hopefully helpful uh, for your pacing. Project number three, there are a couple number, there are a couple of things I still need to test out, but it will be posted um, today. Uh, in fact, when I get back to my office, I'm supposed to meet with somebody. And um, after that, I will uh, run home and then finish testing what I needed to test out and then post project number three. And so project number three <clears throat> will be due a week from today. Um, I don't have the time there. Apologize that the usual 11.59 and 59 seconds. Um, Canvas doesn't allow me to set that precise time, 59 seconds. So you'll notice it's usually 12.01. Okay, so there's my approximation. Um, the grading, I'm still going through. Um, the grading was done for, um, was it homework one? Uh, I might go back and update something based on an ambiguity. And it's related to whether you add the counts for teams or you multiply. Um, about half the class did it one way, half did it the other way. So I take that as ambiguity with the question and I might go back and um, restore the minus one point uh, that I deducted uh, on that for those who got that deduction. Um, the uh, written exam number one, um, I'm going through that and I will have the grading done targeting uh, middle of the week. And um, there's something else I was gonna say, I honestly can't remember. I can't remember. All right, I'll probably remember later. <laughs> okay, where we last left off, uh, we talked about the time APIs in Python. We talked about the date time library, which is used to represent specific instance in time. And we talked about um, the algebra that it implements as well as the ability to represent fixed periods, as well as intervals between some start time and some uh, stop time. Um, with this, we started out with the date object and the time object. And there's also an object called date time that puts together the two constructs where date is uh, year, month, day, and time is hour, minute, second, and microsecond if uh, you choose to represent down to that level of granularity. And so with these, when you represent some instant in time, you can represent it along whatever granularity you want, but it's going to still fill in default values for those things you don't represent. So if you're only representing, for example, for the time part, hours, it's gonna fill in default zero values uh, for minutes and seconds, and it won't display uh, the microseconds portion to jar your memories. Any questions about this? Seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? <clears throat> All right. And so we had another um, example with our reading in or ingesting of a CSV file using a data frame. And one of the things that's typical when you have data that's logged is it includes the date or date time for which each particular instantiation of our vector value quantity uh, when it was taken. And so when you read in the CSV, sometimes it's very useful to replace the default index for the data frame from its numerical value, which is the default, uh, with the date that was associated when, with the instant when that particular measurement was taken. And so in this example, 
we read in lightweight vehicle sales and we specify the options index underscore column. And when we give it uh, a name, index column, we specify <clears throat> the key associated with that column in the data frame where that date stamp information is contained. And then we also have another option we discussed called parse dates. If it's set to true, it's gonna use your default locale, uh, North America or US, uh, which is uh, year, month, day. But you can also optionally specify an alternate representation or parsing or interpretation of the dates column entries in your data file. And so if you were, for example, collaborating with a European colleague and the date was represented differently and you were reading his or her CSV file, you'd have to make sure you're parsing it appropriately. Okay, many questions? Make sense? Draw your memories? <clears throat> okay. And so in this case, for lightweight vehicle sales, uh, we have two columns, the date and the total for lightweight vehicle sales. And we're specifying to replace uh, the default index uh, with the contents of uh, the date column. Okay. Any questions? No? No coffee can't fix this kind of tired. All right. Yeah, I hear you. And so another useful thing we saw was to re-aggregate all of our date information on various time boundaries like year, month, quarter, etc. And when we do so, we do so through uh, the resample uh, method on the data frame after reading in our CSV file. And you can specify a so-called rule option. And if you specify year or month or week or quarter, it's going to instantiate a date time index resampler. And you can think of this as a type of container. So it has a set of lists and in each list is one of those entries rows from your data frame um, aligned to that particular boundary. And so if you had two years worth of data and you resampled on a year boundary, it's gonna have two lists, one with all of the data for the first year and all another list with all of the data for the second year. And so the useful thing about this is once you re-aggregate, you can now ask it to compute all sorts of summaries based on uh, these temporal boundaries. And so the thing to remember here, the important part, is that this is a data structure and it has a set of functions or methods associated with it for the computer scientist in the room, a so-called object. And when you exercise or call these functions or APIs or methods on this object, it performs that operation on each one of the lists inside of this data structure, our date time index resampler. Okay, so you can't print this thing out. You have to perform some operation and it's the result of that operation that you can print out. Okay, any questions? Does that make sense? All right. <clears throat> and so we had an example scraping uh, a year's worth of data from Yahoo Finance uh, for Apple Incorporated. And we enterprised here uh, to plot something that looked a lot like the ticker chart, the stock chart with the volume underlay. And so with this, uh, we took our data frame, we read in the CSV file, and anyone can go on Yahoo Finance and enter in a company name and say, show me um, the financial information for an arbitrary security that's publicly traded. <clears throat> and then once we ingest that, we take our data frame, we re-aggregate on a quarterly basis. So that's every three months, Q1, two, three, four. And then we compute the mean. And so once we compute the mean, here you see on the index, on the result of resampling, we call the mean. So this is gonna give us the average uh, for um, each one of these measurements on a quarterly basis. So that's three months worth of trading data, Q1, two, three, and four uh, for the year. And so with this now, we are returned back a data frame. In this case, we assign it to a variable called the means, right? Just to be descriptive. Now that's a concrete data frame. And as a data frame, now we can use our slice notation to pull out the individual columns or series uh, for the quarterly average for the closing price and the quarterly average uh, for the trading volume, the number of shares that were traded over the course of that particular trading day. Okay, any questions? Does that make sense? Okay. 
So now in a subplot, uh, a two by one slice, we first plot the quarterly uh, average uh, closing price. And we also plot below that the volume uh, for that quarter. And you'll notice here uh, along the horizontal axis, uh, we notice that the key names that we used are uh, the tick marks representing those instants in time for the reporting period. And these particular tick marks on the horizontal axis represent the last day for the quarter. And so here we have Q4, December 31st, and then we have Q1 of the next year, 2018, uh, March 31st, et cetera. And that was done for you by the resampler. It says, I'm gonna compute these averages. So it changes the default index to represent that particular temporal boundary that you ask the resampler uh, to produce for you. Okay, any questions? So immensely useful stuff here. All right, does that make sense? Yeah, all right. And so, let's see where we are. <clears throat> I don't know why we did this here. Okay, another, I can't remember why I did this. Let me just go for it a little bit. Okay, yeah, yeah. All right, so, Another thing that is very useful, and we'll make use of this in uh, the thing, the main uh, thing I wanted to present to you today, is um, oftentimes when you look at something, a time series like stock, um, depending on how frequently you're making measurements, you're gonna see this quantity um, has a lot of variance, right? It has a, a high standard deviation. And as anybody who deals with finance will tell you, you're less concerned about the moment to moment share price and you're more concerned with the trend. Is it increasing, is it decreasing or maintaining relatively level over some period or span of time? And so one of the things that's very useful is that you often wanna so-called smooth or make a uh, lower standard deviation, the quantity of measurement. And so one of the very typical ways of doing that is a so-called uh, rolling average or windowed average. And so here we have a year's worth of Costco data. Costco is a multinational membership-based uh, big box retailer. And we also have uh, the year, a year's worth of ticker or, or securities data for a share of Exxon Mobil, which is a global energy company specializing in oil and gas. And so you can see both Exxon and Costco, they kind of are very unstable over short spans of time. And so here, what you can do with your data frame quite easily is using the rolling method on your data frame. So we read in our Costco uh, stock data, replacing uh, the default index uh, with the date stamp and the date stamp for publicly traded security is going to be the day of the week, only weekdays, this during business. And if there's a federal holiday, it's going to skip that day if the markets are closed, which they do on federal holidays. Okay, any questions? No? And so here, <clears throat> we take our data frame and we slice out uh, the closing price. Uh, in this example, that's what we're interested in. And once we get that series, we call the rolling method on it. And that's a rolling average, um, averaging every consecutive five measurements. So you take the first five measurements, compute the average, slide the window, the next five, the next five are rejecting the oldest measurement and admitting uh, the next measurement in sequence. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions? No? So again, once you compute the mean, that's when you're given a series. And one of the very convenient things we can do with a data frame is we can create a new column by inserting what looks like slice notation, but you'll notice this key value, roll five close, it's a new string, right? It doesn't exist. And so when we do that and we assign that new um, slice, if you will, to the result of computing that series, we end up with a new column uh, in that data frame. Does that make sense? Okay. And so now we're gonna plot two things. We're gonna plot the unmodified closing price, uh, that's uh, C1. And we're also gonna plot um, the uh, five 
the rolling average uh, five window version of the closing price. And so the unmodified closing price is in the blue and the rolling average uh, is in the red. And you'll notice here that the blue curve is a lot more spiky, has a higher standard deviation than the red curve. It's smoother. And so you can verify this, don't believe me, if you took a histogram of the data for the closing price and a histogram for the data of uh, the windowed average of the closing price, you'd notice that the standard deviation is smaller, and you can even do that numerically by computing the standard deviation. Okay, any questions? Does that make sense? And so the reason for smoothing this windowed average is a lot, it's a lot easier from the red curve to get the general trend of where the share price is going versus these jagged spikes. Now, this is the daily closing price, but on some stock quote services, you can get these things um, every, uh, I think it's five times a second or something like that. You'd have to pay a lot of money uh, to get access to those services. Um, but 15 minute delay is very typical uh, for sort of a, an individual for a lot of these um, for pay stock ticker services. And you can imagine if you looked at it every 15 minutes instead of the closing price every day, um, it would be a lot more jagged uh, or unstable. Okay, any questions? And so sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, the smooth version makes it a lot easier to see the trend of where that price is going. Is it increasing? Is it decreasing? Or is it maintaining relatively uh, stable around some value? Any questions? Does that make sense? <clears throat> Okay, and so we do the same thing for ExxonMobil. And again, as you can see, um, the red curve, the smooth version, window rolling window average, is less jagged uh, than the blue curve. Now the impact of the window size here, we have a window size of five measurements. If we had 10 measurements, it would get more and more smooth. And effectively what's, no, I'll save that for the next module. Um, that I'm right about to talk about. It gets more and more smooth as you increase the window size. Okay, any questions? I sort of feel like I'm such dragging and everything I'm trying to say, it's in there, but it doesn't get out. So here <clears throat> in this chart, we register both of the graphs, uh, the smooth version of uh, Costco in blue and Exxon Mobil in red. And so with the smooth version, it's a lot easier to sort of back of the envelope tell if there's a positive correlation, if there's a negative correlation, or if there's no correlation. Now you might ask yourself, what does ExxonMobil have to do with Costco? Well, um, most of the goods in this country are transported over land uh, by truck. And of course, um, big rigs, my uncle was a truck driver, um, they get about three miles per gallon. And if you ever see a big rig on the road, they have these two big silver tanks on the left and right hand side of the cab, those are 500 gallon tanks. So you can imagine pumping a thousand gallons of diesel getting three miles a gallon. So the price of fuel of gasoline, diesel or unleaded um, greatly impacts the cost of goods because those costs for fuel prices, if the cost of oil and gas goes up, gasoline, a derivative, so too do all these goods that you see in the markets both dry goods as well as durable goods. Um, things like food items, as well as things like electronics. Okay, and so with the smooth version, it's a lot easier to see things like correlations versus the unmodified version of the closing price, which would be a lot more jagged because it's harder to see these trends over time. Okay, any questions? Join your memories, yeah? All right. <clears throat> so. This idea of this weighted average, when we take the weighted average, yeah, it's a good thing. And yes, it does smooth out your data to allow you to more easily uh, see the trends over time, but it's not without its drawbacks and limitations. And so when we take a windowed average, let's imagine we're doing that with the closing price for Costco data, which we just showed. We take every consecutive five measurements in this case, we have the first five measurements, and we're gonna replace that fifth measurement uh, with this weighted average. And so just to the right, we have the formula, and we take every five measurements, the ith, 
through the i plus four, and we divide by five, okay? Now, if you think about this operation, each one of these measurements is being multiplied by the same scalar, one upon five. And it's almost like a vote. It's saying, I wanna vote as to what I think the value should be. Each one of these measurements, these five measurements, xi through xi plus four, gets an equal say because their weight is the same, one upon five. Okay, but then the question is, should they get an equal say? As this window grows larger, the question arises, how relevant is this first measurement if your window is say 20 measurements long? If you wanna represent where the share price is going for this temporal measurement, is what happened 20 measurements ago, and if it's the closing price, that's 20 trading days ago, is that indicative of what's happening right now? So while this windowed average is useful in showing you trends, if you kind of overdo it, you no longer are as valid or you're stale or your world model is obsolete as to what the share price is doing more recently right now. So this can certainly be remedied, but this is just to say when you compute this moving average, you want to be careful about how big your window size is. If you overdo it and you're making trading decisions based on what this average is saying, it might be obsolete because you're looking too far into the past. Does that make sense? Any questions? No? All right. And so here, as the window grows larger and larger and larger, should there be equal say? Well, Sometimes you can think of an argument where there should be equal say among all the measurements in the window. Sometimes there's an argument that they shouldn't have equal say. If you're interested in what happens to your share price behavior more recently, then you wanna count those more recent measurements more than those measurements that were a long time ago in the past, okay? So this is the domain of the so-called exponential weighted moving average. And this is the form for the uh, exponential weighted moving average. We're interested in a sum, a weighted sum at some particular time instant. Now, of course, if the window is five measurements long, it's the fifth measurement where you're gonna get the first value. Everything before that is gonna be not a number because you need five measurements for it to work, okay? Um, so what it does, it says, okay, well, my idea of what is the sum is going to be some proportion, we'll call alpha, of the, is this incorrect? Yep, that's incorrect. Looks like a typo. All right. There we go. That's correct. It's going to be some proportion, alpha, of the current measurement, xt, plus another proportion, one minus alpha of the previous weighted sum. So you can think of this ST minus one, yes, it's the previous weighted sum, but you can think of it as a summary of your history. Because if you took the average performance or the average value over, for example, the last 10 days, you could think of that as, oh, that's, that's a summary statistic for your history that represents your behavior from the past. And so the larger the window size, the longer the history considers measurements further and further back in the past. So what this alpha does is it regulates how much of your current version of the sum depends on your most recent measurement and how much of it depends on your history, S sub T minus one. Now alpha for this to work, <clears throat> has to be on the closed interval between zero and one on the real number line. Okay, first, any questions about the form? And so the new summary is equal to uh, some mixture, some part of the current measurement and some other part of the history. Any questions? Does that make sense? Okay. Now it's called exponential weighted moving average. Why is it called exponential? So let's take this expression and let's work with it for a little bit. Um, so for those of you who are not computer science, this is a special class of um, 
relation, I won't call it a function, called the recurrence relation. And how a recurrence relation works, and I'm afraid to go too far from this because my headset's gonna run out. How a recurrence relation works is every time you want a new evaluation of this particular relation, relation a function is a very specific type of relation. But every time you want a new evaluation of this relation, you can compute that new evaluation, but it uses the old value in that new evaluation. And so if I want the summary at time t, our weighted sum, our current history, our updated history, that's some part of the new measurement plus some part of the old history. Now the next time instant is gonna be t plus one. So how do you compute that? You say, okay, I take my new measurement. My new measurement at the next time instant is x t plus one, some part of the new measurement, the current measurement, plus another part of the history. Now, if it's the next summary, the history was what you computed at that previous time step. Does that make sense? And so a recurrence relation is a type, I'll abuse notation and say function. It's not really a function. It's a type of expression, I'll say it that way, where the evaluation of the next value at the next instant depends on the evaluation at the previous instant. Does that make sense? Any questions? No questions? No? All right. And so when you take a recurrence relation and you want to find a general expression for it, you have to effectively what's called unwind the recurrence. You look at it, its evaluation again and again and again, and you express mathematically the pattern that arises. Okay. And so here, if we compute our recurrence relation at the next time instant, okay. We take our first evaluation and we substitute that in as the history. Does that make sense? Yeah. So substituting in, okay. Well, for S sub T, I substituted in these square brackets and I do the algebra and some observations here. I still have my alpha component counting some part, my new measurement. I have this leading alpha times quantity one minus alpha times the previous measurement, and I have plus one minus alpha squared times the previous history. Now, the thing to remember is that alpha is between zero and one on the real number line. And so alpha is typically less than one. And anytime you have an expression or multiple expressions that are less than one and you multiply them together, whether it's by itself through exponentiation, or here we have alpha, times one minus alpha, a decimal times a decimal is another decimal that's even smaller. And so taken more generally, if we have some decimal alpha and we multiply it by itself, some k many times where k is a natural number, well, anything to the zero power is one, but then once we start multiplying it by another decimal, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller till it eventually is what we call effectively zero. So small, you might as well call it zero. And that curve is called exponential decay. And so what that has the impact of, you notice here, when we unwind our recurrence, just for one time step, we see alpha times the current measurement, we see a little bit less times the previous measurement, and we have even less for that history. Does that make sense? And so what ends up happening, it's called exponential weighted moving average because how these measurements within the window are added together is with an unequal vote. Those measurements that are more recent um, have a higher weight or more of a vote. And those measurements that are either in the past or the histories that are in the past have less of a vote about what the next summary value should be. Okay, any questions? <clears throat> Does that make sense? Okay. Now, of course, the longer the window size, the more terms you're gonna have. Um, and the smaller alpha is. Okay. <laughs> it's just, 
it's a long story from my previous institution, but whenever doors fling open, it always, I still kind of that little split second jump. Um, anyways, the closer to one alpha is, the more the emphasis will be on the new measurements. The closer to zero alpha is, the more the summary is gonna be dependent on the histories. Now, the alpha says how much you're gonna count the new measurement versus the history. What's that balance you're striking? The window size tells you how much is gonna decay because that window size corresponds to more measurements, which means more terms. Any questions? Does that make sense? And so if you were doing this exponential weighted moving average, the reason that you use this over the, um, the rolling average is that the EWMA is more responsive to abrupt changes uh, in your measured quantity. And so if you have a security, and let's say your security shoots up in price, your EWMA is gonna capture that in the summary more than the rolling average will. Does that make sense? Because it counts it more depending on your alpha. Any questions? No questions? And so this is the same slide said, as uh, the exponent increases, um, the uh, history uh, that it uses in the summary decreases. Okay. And so I like to pronounce things. And um, I always pronounce it you, ma, like you're getting bad medicine. But um, this is uh, good for you, like bad medicine. And it seemed really funny this morning, but I guess it's not so funny um, with daylight savings missing an hour. So I'm going to call it UMA because I don't want to keep saying exponential weighted moving average. Okay. And this, that's the picture I get in my head. All right. So here we have the Costco data and we take uh, Costco data closing price over a year's worth of reporting period uh, for the security off Yahoo Finance. And we compute a couple things. Uh, the rolling average over window size of five. And I know that I call it roll five, but the window size is 10 in the pseudocode. And you can just think of this as pseudocode. Um, I also compute the rolling average for a window size five, even though there's a typo here, uh, for the exponential weighted moving average version. And so it's the same window size, but the difference is how it counts them equal weight versus exponential weight. And the default, which I don't remember off the top of my head, is usually 0.1 for these sort of things. Um, that's certainly something uh, you can look up online. And so when I produce the plot here, C1 in the blue, that's the closing price without any modification. Uh, C2 um, in the red, uh, that's the rolling average, so equal weight, uh, a fair vote, so to speak. And then in the green here, the green curve is the closing price that has an exponential weighting, move, weighted moving average. And so some observations here in the blue, you can see that there's a much higher variance. You have some spikiness, especially around here and around here, okay? If we look at the red curve, it's a lot smoother. We see that the share price increases over this span. The red curve does so uh, more smoothly. But if we look at the green curve, there are runs over time where they coincide, like along here, but when this spike dramatically decreases, um, you notice the green curve captures that a lot better than the red curve. The red curve considers too much of the history to react uh, within that time window uh, to that dramatic decrease. And so the exponential weighted or the UMA is good for capturing recent changes if the recency is important to you uh, in your analysis. Any questions? Does that make sense? Now, what is the right window size? It depends on your application. It depends on how much, um, how much, uh, I wanna say entropy, I haven't talked about that. How wiggly the graph is within some span, okay? And it's something you have to experiment with. Okay, any questions? No, makes sense? All right. And so let's use this in a real uh, consideration. And because we're not all business majors, I'm not a business major. I had to talk to a friend of mine who specializes in finance. Uh, in economics, there's a quantity, a so-called leading indicator. And there's an organization called the Baltic Exchange. And what the Baltic Exchange does is they track all sorts of data um, concerning shipping routes. 
And so cargo ships make their way around the world uh, to deliver both raw materials as well as finished goods. And that's both on the dry goods, like food items sold in bulk, as well as the durable goods, things like electronics and appliances and such. And so there's a URL if you're interested in Baltic uh, exchange. And so the world is very interconnected. The so-called global supply chain uh, is an area of business where you look at all of the inputs, concerns, considerations uh, that go into ultimately at the end, um, some product that you might see uh, in a retail establishment, be that a food product uh, or a durable good. And so we live in an interconnected world. It's unavoidable. And supply chain talks about all of the influences going from a raw material at the input uh, to a finished good uh, at the output. And so when the economy is good, that means companies have a high demand for their products and they often adjust to that demand by increasing their supply. So they see, gosh, well, um, people are making more money. Uh, we need to sell more products because at least in the US, our economy is for the most part uh, consumer driven, not completely, but for the most part. And so when people have more money in their pocket, they're prospering, they buy more goods and they recruit more services. And so companies see this increase in demand and they respond to that by ramping up their production, specifically increasing the orders for all of the items that they're enterprising to sell. And so in order to do that, okay, raw materials travel in one direction uh, around the world. Um, and as a result, they get finished and integrated into final products and the finished product travels um, across the world in the other direction. And so supply and demand means that if more vendors are vying for the available cargo space, um, that cargo space is going to increase in price. And so that average price of shipping cargo space is one of the many statistics or measurements uh, that the Baltic Exchange tracks. Now, why am I talking about cargo space? Okay, well, let me finish my thought. When the economy is bad, conversely, people typically rein in spending. They buy less of things or they make do with those items that they have. So that means demand drops. And as demand drops, the inventory is not moving from these retail concerns. And they say, hey, wait a minute, people aren't buying this. Inventory, carrying inventory is costly. Uh, there's a depreciation or decrease in value over time associated with inventory that you're holding. And so they decide to decrease their orders. So that means there's less demand for this cargo space, sending these raw materials in one direction and these finished goods uh, in the other direction. Okay. Does that make sense? No, I am not an economist. I have friends who are. Um, certainly, if you're interested in supply chain, it's a really fantastic um, area to get into, both on the data side as well as the business side. Okay, so why cargo space then? Well, the cost of cargo space is a predictor of where the market's going to go. Because before these increase in amount of goods, the corporate output happens, you have to send the raw materials in one direction and you have to send the finished goods in the other direction. And so the cost of cargo space changes ahead of the market. Before the companies make more profit, the cargo space increases in price because more people are vying for the space in which to store these raw materials in one direction and these finished goods in the other. And so quantities such as the average cost of cargo space that lead or are ahead of another measurement is a so-called leading indicator. Okay. Any questions about this? No? All right. And so the global, so the supply chain uh, consists of all of the components um, that goes into producing some good. Now, the supply chain might involve aspects of the raw materials, but it can also involve the labor conditions in a market, the geopolitics between uh, countries, etc. So let's take the example of chocolate. Mmm, chocolate. Chocolate tastes great, okay? 
It also has very good health benefits. It's high in antioxidants, believe it or not, it is, okay? Now you might know some considered fine brands of chocolate like Scharfenberger, Calibo, and there are others. These are just the two that I know. Um, chocolate comes from a raw material, uh, cacao, it's the main ingredient, and cacao is a fruit. Um, in fact, when I was a kid, uh, my grandfather on his farm grew cacao, among other things. And on the right-hand side, these are cacao trees. And it starts out, it's green. And when it ripens, it can turn beautiful orange and reds and mixtures of things like that. If you crack open one of these cacaos, and if you're familiar with papaya, it kind of looks like a more eccentric elliptical papaya, right? But it's a little bit tougher than a papaya. Papayas can get really soft when they ripen. So you crack open a cacao pod, and it looks like this. And you have these white membranes. And inside of these membranes um, is a type of vegetable fat, the cocoa butter. And it's almost like um, uh, avocados, right? In its consistency. It's a little bit creamier, um, but the cocoa butter is inside these membranes. And in the center of the membrane, um, inside of the cocoa butter is the cocoa seed or cacao seed. And so you crack it open and you have different parts of it. You have the pod. And then you have the pulp, which is the cocoa butter, and then you have the membrane, and then you have the bean, which is effectively the seed um, in this fruit uh, for the cacao tree. All right. And so this cacao <clears throat> starts out as an agricultural product, or it's grown on a farm, and it's typically put in wooden boxes set outside because it's expensive to do this, and they're covered with banana leaf and fermented, right? Uh, this up here, upper left. And of course they add like essential bacteria and things like that for the fermentation process. And after they fermented, it changes a little bit, changes a little bit uh, or a lot, the taste of these things. It's then dried. These are dried cacao beans. And then it's roasted, kind of like how coffee is roasted. And after it's roasted, it's ground up. And here, this is cacao powder or chocolate powder. Sometimes a little moisture is added and it's created into a paste. Now, this ground version, that's closer to the chocolate that you know, but ground cacao um, is higher uh, butter content or fat content than cocoa powder. The two are very, very different. And so you can buy cocoa butter, cocoa butter in bulk, or cocoa butter has a lot of really good properties uh, for skincare products in particular, some hair care products. And it's very known as to have very healing properties for skin. Like if you have a burn or you have um, like a mark because of a uh, scar that healed, cocoa butter is known to help you um, heal these, these blemishes. And so there's a market both for the butter, um, but the big money or bigger money uh, is for the cacao uh, paste itself, which is the ground chocolate. Any questions? No? All right. And so... Um, in Jamaica, they have something called cocoa tea, and you can take this cacao uh, ground, add a little moisture, and form it into what looks like charcoal briquettes, and this is a solid form of uh, cocoa, and if you want the best hot chocolate of your life, uh, go to a store that sells Caribbean products and get these cacao bricks, and uh, you grate them, uh, put a little milk in a pot with the powder you grate, and it's the best hot chocolate you've ever had in your life. It'll make you fall asleep. It's like really rich. Ground cacao has 35% butter content, fat content, whereas um, cocoa powder, which you would often buy in the supermarket for hot chocolate, has about 11 to 22%. So it's much richer. Okay. Now, all of that being said, I just want to tell you a little bit about supply chain. Most of the cocoa beans, uh, at least to the EU, which is the source of some of the finest chocolates in the world, uh, come from three countries, Ivory Coast, Ghana, and Nigeria, right? Um, and if you think about it, cacao needs a tropical environment. So it needs heat, it needs a lot of rain, and it needs humidity. You don't get that in Switzerland, you don't get that in Germany, and you don't get that in Belgium. They get most of their cacao from these uh, three countries. So it's not really Belgian chocolate you're eating, you're eating Ivory Coast chocolate, so to speak, at least where the beans come from. And certainly there's a big effort afoot um, for fair trade as it comes uh, to cacao beans. 
Because as you can imagine, the earlier in the process at the cacao fruit stage of it, there's less money involved. And on each stage of processing, our so-called supply chain, you have increased value. There's more and more money wrapped up in the more and more refined good. So supply chain for chocolate, well, you get the chocolate. You start with the cacao plant at the grower, it gets harvested. And certainly at the growing and the harvest side, um, there's climate wrapped up in the supply chain impacting price. There's geopolitics wrapped up in the price. And there's also labor conditions wrapped up in the price. All of those have input on what the price is for the cacao fruit, as well as the harvesting of the cacao fruit. So then you add more value by fermenting and drying. Okay, that involves labor conditions, as well as the equipment and the operating costs. And then you have these dried beans sold on the global market. Okay. And so it gets packaged. So you have the jobbers, the transportation costs involved, which involves fuel, as well as labor and geopolitics. And then it's shipped to facilities that do the roasting and grinding. In fact, there's an area of Delaware, um, not too far from the port of Wilmington, where I think it's, it's one of Hershey's uh, roasting plants. And if you drive by there, it smells marvelous, right? Um, but that being the case, you have the roasting and grinding. And then that paste or bricks is sent for processing where you mix things into it like nuts and caramel and all sorts of other things. And then it goes to the companies like Scharfenberger and Calibo and they actually make uh, the chocolate. That's where you melt it, you put it in different molds and you make what looks like chocolate to you. Okay, any questions? Does that make sense? And so each one of these stages involves transportation. It involves shipping or some modality for getting the output of each stage to the input of the next stage. And that spans over global uh, reach. And so the so-called global supply chain deals with all of the pieces involved with each one of those steps along the supply chain. And this is just a small example for cacao. Can you imagine something like a washing machine or, you know, um, or broccoli or something like that. Okay, and so the global supply chain is a finely tuned set of multimodal transport that gets these goods and refined products from the raw material side to each one of these stages in the supply chain, ultimately to the finished good. Now, certainly you can transport via air freight, but that's the most expensive transportation modality. Uh, the cheapest ones are the surface modes of transportation. That's where um, the cargo ships come in. Cargo ships are the primary modality for transporting bulk goods and services from automobiles to appliances to food items uh, from various ports in locations scattered all around the world. And so the surface modality on land consists of trucks uh, or rail if you're going over a longer haul uh, than is feasible for trucks because diesel fuel is expensive. Okay, any questions? Does that make sense? Okay, so why are we doing this? It's so finely tuned, they've standardized in uh, containers that you stuff as full as you can with whatever good or product uh, you can get into it. And so there are two main sizes for shipping containers. There's the half size 20 foot shipping container and there's the full size, the 40 foot shipping container. And these transportation modalities for surface are so finely tuned, they standardized on these two types of containers uh, for shipping. And that's the price that you're paying for when you talk about unit of storage, uh, which is tracked uh, by the Baltic exchange. Does that make sense? Any questions? No? So on the top here, that's a half size uh, shipping container, 20 foot. And then on the lower right, you're right, that's a full size 40 foot container uh, to give you perspective with uh, two adults. And this is a cargo ship laden uh, with uh, full size and half size uh, shipping containers. They stack them high and long, right? And that's, if you can imagine the cost or value associated with all the contents or all, of, all the containers, uh, that can number in the hundreds of millions. And in fact, so important is um, the safe transport 
of the shipping containers and the contents of them, that there's an enormous industry for freight insurance. And if you know who Mitt Romney is, the former governor of Massachusetts and senator of Utah, he made his fortune uh, from shipping insurance. Go figure. Okay. So that being the case, these ships go from port to port around the world, and they come into the port. In fact, uh, the port of Boston is a big one. Port of Philadelphia is big. Port of New York, Port of Wilmington. They dot all around uh, the coastal regions of the country. The ships come in, and they have special cranes with lifts um, that are sized, tuned to these half-size and full-size shipping containers. And they have 18-wheelers, uh, semi-trucks, or trailer trucks, and one of these um, shipping containers perfectly fits on uh, the bed of a trailer. So you have these trucks coming in to the shipping facility. They unload the cargo ship, put them right on a truck, and they're off and down the road to bring them from the coastal regions to the interior uh, to major cities uh, throughout the country. Any questions? Same thing for trains. There are train cars that specifically fit one of these full-size shipping containers. And so here on the bottom, we have a half-size shipping container. There's a trailer with a medium standard size pickup truck. Uh, you can drag one anywhere you want to your heart's desire. And on the top here, we have an 18-wheeler semi-trailer truck with a 40-foot uh, full-size shipping container. And so everything is tuned for surface uh, transportation uh, to these full-size and half size uh, shipping containers. And so, so ubiquitous are these things that people have uh, repurposed them for things like housing. They make perfect um, housing. And in fact, there are some who make businesses out of taking retired shipping containers. They're no longer um, uh, robust enough for shipping, but they're perfectly fine uh, for insulating and uh, modification uh, to make uh, a modular housing. Okay, any questions? That makes sense? And so why is cargo space a good proxy uh, for talking about economic health ahead of the market? Well, if you wanted to build a new cargo ship, then it would be very reasonable to say, well, if you need more cargo space, just build more cargo ships. It takes roughly three years to build a cargo ship. They're absolutely enormous. If you've ever been on an aircraft carrier, it's about that size. It's huge. It's like two, two or three football fields in length. I don't remember the width. And so you don't just build one. It takes a really long time. And so long it takes to build one that effectively you can't ramp up on more cargo space available in any reasonable amount of time. So you can think of available cargo space at any particular point in time as being very stable because you can't drop the price of it by just saying, build 10 more ships. It doesn't happen that way, okay? All right, any questions about this? Does that make sense? Okay, let me make sure my mic is still on because, all right, I get paranoid about that. Okay, so the so-called Baltic Dry Goods Index um, is computed by the Baltic Exchange and across all the worldwide shipping routes, they compute the average price of available cargo space for one of these full-size 40-foot containers. Okay, and so you can go on free sites. Of course, you can always pay for things, but free is better sometimes. Um, one of them, Trading Economics, uh, and you can Google search it. Uh, you can look up the Baltic Dry Goods um, Index or BADI body, right? And what this symbol represents, it acts like a security, but this particular value or price or measurement is the average price uh, for cargo space for standard size 40 foot uh, shipping container. Does that make sense? And so the idea then is if the cost of cargo space increases, at some point in the future, the cost of goods is also going to increase because there's more demand. And so one of the questions you might want to ask is how far into the future does Batty predict where the market's going to go? So if Costco is getting more goods, Batty is going to go up at some point before Costco's share price goes up. Because selling more goods at Costco means their output is bigger, their revenue is bigger, and therefore the value of the company goes up and that's reflected in an increase in the share price. Does that make sense? Any questions? All right. 
So all of that background is just to say the Baltic Dry Goods Index is a leading indicator and it's the average cost of shipping space. And it's a really good predictor of where the market's gonna go. And it leads uh, increase in share prices uh, for those who sell goods. All right. And so the theory is, and my friend from finance said it's about a six month leading indicator. And if you actually look at the Baltic Dry Goods Index ticker uh, measurement, you can see that about six months or so, plus or minus, after Batty goes up, so too does the market. And that could be an individual security or a basket of securities related to some sector or set, like computer chips, computer hardware, silicon, uh, you know, parts and stuff like that. Any questions? Does that make sense? All right. And so let's take a look at the data science process um, as it pertains to how you might look at the relationship between the Baltic Dry Goods Index and say something like Costco stock. Okay. So we start out, we have Costco, ticker symbol for some reporting period, and we have the Baltic Dry Goods Index body um, for that same reporting period. And so you might enterprise to ask how well does Batty predict Costco share price? Now, of course, people make use of these sorts of information leading indicators, because if they notice that Costco is not doing well and Batty is going up, they're gonna load up on this Costco stock before this impending increase at some point in the future. But the question you might ask is how far into the future? Yes, theoretically, it's about six months, but it might be a little more, it might be a little less, and you can certainly apply things that you've learned so far, we've learned so far with temporal sequences in order to calculate this from data. Okay, so we're gonna start out with the data wrangle and go to Yahoo Finance. Now, if we were to do this for real, you'd subscribe to a service and get 15 minute delay information for more fine grain resolution. But nonetheless, for this class, you go out and you get the data. So you're gonna download or find the ticker symbol for Costco, you just Google search it, and then download the CSV file for the open, close, high, low, and volume uh, for Costco over a particular uh, reporting period. So then you go off and get Baltic Dry Goods Index uh, ticker uh, from those boards that have it. Trading economics is one of them. You can get it for free. And of course, there are many opportunities to pay for stuff. Don't pay for stuff for this class. But that being the case, you download the data, and now you're going to integrate the data, and you're going to clean the data. The Costco data is pristine, but the Batty data is a little bit wonky, and you have to change it a little bit. Now, of course, when it's reported, when it reports thousands for the Batty index, they use commas to separate the thousand decimal place, uh, the thousand place. So it'll say 1,000 is one comma zero zero zero, which is not amenable to CSV file format, right? So you have to make some replacements. And so you correct for that. And then also carriage return line feed, um, because I use Unix, as another conversion that you might want to be aware of for how you do line termination uh, for these text files. Um, the Baltic Dry Goods Index, Batty, has uh, some empty columns, the volume, at least from trading economics. You have to buy the subscription to get the full version of the data. Um, and so you have to correct for that. And then also has mixed types. It has, um, I forgot the mix, it's numerical and string and some other things. And so when you import or ingest data that's mixed type, uh, the default when you pull it into memory is to have things as objects. And sometimes you want things as numbers in order to do things like plot graphs. Okay, any questions? Does that make sense? And so that's just the slogging along, um, doing all the cleaning, looking for the blemishes in your data and correcting them as appropriate, which also includes looking for not a number entries. You have to make a decision about what to do should you encounter not a number. Okay, any questions? No? All right. So now um, you load your data into data frames. So now we're no longer going to use NumPy. You're like, yay. <laughs> and we're going to use data frames because it affords us all those very useful uh, methods that we can call both on the series as well as the data frame itself. Um, compute a rolling average, uh, which is the simple moving average, where each measurement in the window gets equal weight, um, as we had discussed. And we're also going to um, compute the, the ILMA, right? Um, because we want to see what happens 
when you emphasize the more recent measurements uh, in your reporting of your averages. Now, it's exponential weighted moving average. It's called an average, but this average does not have equal weight for each one of the measurements in the window. Does that make sense? Any questions? No? And then we're going to visualize it. And then when we visualize it, we're going to look at the batty of visualization as a line plot next to the Costco visualization as a line plot. But we're going to shift the Baltic dry goods index at um, time steps into the future over some period, measuring the correlation to see how much of a predictor into the future it is. Does that make sense? Any questions? No? All right, and then we're gonna answer the question, uh, which was how predictive is it? And so we start out, we're gonna import our useful libraries, um, date and time, time delta, just because it's a useful thing to import. Uh, NumPy, because it's always good to import NumPy. And Pandas, because we're going to use uh, some data frames and matplotlib, uh, of course, to do visualization. But um, all right. So now, <clears throat> excuse me, we read in the Costco data and we're going to replace the default index with the date column, which is a useful thing to do. So here, when we uh, say give us the first 10 entries, you notice here the default index along uh, the left-hand column is no longer that default, which is integer zero through K. Uh, it's now the date, okay? All right, any questions? All right. So now we do the same thing with the cleaned Baltic dry goods or baddie um, data, and we bring it in or ingest it into a data frame. Again, replacing the date stamp um, with, replacing the default index with the date stamp, and then we just examine it. Oftentimes it's useful, useful rather, to examine uh, the first K uh, many entries. And so we can see here, it has the price. It has the opening price. That price uh, is the, I think it's the average. We have the high and the low. Why are they all the same? All right, this is the free version. So um, you get better data with the subscription, which I refuse to do. Well, I do it personally, but not for the class. So now you examine it. And here, we're going to compute the rolling average for some window size. And it's up to you to determine what the right window size is, depending on how smooth that you want uh, this uh, representation to be. So here, if the window size is, for example, 10, you'll notice when we display the first 10 elements, it's not a number for the first nine of them. And it's the 10th element that actually has data. And so if you were to compute this windowed average, and then you want to produce a plot, you have to figure out what you're gonna do with those first nine entries, which are not a number, okay? All right, any questions? No? All right. So now, uh, we do the same thing. Um, what did I do here? Is this? Oh, I'm sorry. We do that with the Costco data, and then we do it with the Baltic dry goods uh, data. Okay. So now, we're gonna compute the, uh, the UMA, all right, EWM is the API call, and it's a method both on the data frame as well as attached to a series. And with the UMA, you can give it a span. Uh, why it's not called window? I don't know. Maybe somebody missed the engineering meeting. But you give it a span, and that'll tell you how big the window is of measurements over which it does this exponential um, UMA. Okay. So we do this UMA for the Costco data, closing price. And we do this UMA uh, for the BATI data uh, for the price. And it's really important that you use the same window size or else your measurement is going to be off, especially if you're making comparisons uh, using things like correlation. Okay, any questions? Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, you can. I'm just taking the default. Most of these things, it's usually uh, 0.1 is the default, uh, but you can absolutely, it's alpha equals and you give it that scalar. Okay, any other questions? No, all right. And so here we have the closing price of Costco, the rolling window price for Costco, and we're gonna plot them together, okay? And so here, like we saw before, the green is the, X, is the UMA version. And we can see that it's smooth, but it reacts better uh, to um, dramatic changes in the unmodified data. And so we do the same thing with the BATI data. We compute the price, 
we compute uh, the rolling window, and then we compute the UMA version of the rolling window. And here is the baddie in the blue is the uh, regular price. That's the average for the trading day. Um, and then we have in the red, uh, the rolling window average. And then we have in the green, we have uh, the UMA version of the weighted window. And so here, you'll notice here, this blue curve, we have a dramatic spike down and it shoots up. Um, the green curve reacts a little bit better uh, than the red curve. And that's particularly evident around here. We have these jagged bumps, as well as when you have changes in direction. Okay, any questions? So this is just the unadulterated data, the rolling window average data, and the UMA version of the data for Batty. And on the previous slide, it was for Costco. So now we're going to do our correlation. And so for a correlation, we're going to assume we have two series we call data X and data Y. And then we give it uh, an option. And this is a function I've written called lag. And what it's going to do, it's going to take the first series that you input and it's compute correlation with the right series, but that right series is shifted some number of measurements in time based on that lag. Okay, why they didn't do that early or later, I don't know. All right, um, does that make sense? So this is just a utility routine that's going to take the correlation between X series and a shifted version of Y series where the default is a lag of zero. Okay, so now you say, okay, well, let's try the correlation at different lags and you can control whether that lag is from zero to 90, zero to 180, or what have you. So in a loop, we're gonna set a lag to a number of different values, and then we're gonna compute the correlation between one series and another at different shifted versions of that second um, data Y. Does that make sense? All right. And of course, I'm printing it off. So now we wanna find um, that particular version of Y where the correlation is maximized. And so we compute these correlations for a lag of zero, one, two, three, et cetera. And then we loop through these correlations and find the maximum. Now, of course, this will find the maximum, but remember that correlation ranges between minus one and positive one. So what we're concerned about is the largest absolute value for correlation, not the largest value of correlation. And so here we're doing a standard finding of the maximum but the change we're gonna make is we're gonna take the absolute value of the correlation for each one measured, and we're gonna remember the index where we had the highest magnitude. Does that make sense? Any questions? And so in this example, if for example, the largest lag was at a lag of 52 trading days, remembering that a trading day does not include the weekend. It doesn't include holidays. So it'd be up to you to know how many weeks on the calendar re represented because it's only Monday through Friday um, minus uh, the federal holidays. Any questions? And then of course, knowing it's 52 days, what does that represent on the calendar? And you can actually verify on the calendar um, how much um, the Baltic Dry Goods Index or BATI is a leading indicator uh, for um, Costco stock for the reporting period. Does that make sense? All right, and you can justify this numerically. Now, certainly if you're doing this for real, you wouldn't just have one year's worth of reporting data. You'd have more than one year worth of reporting data because you wanna look at what happened through history, uh, such as what happened when the COVID shutdown occurred. Now, certainly the economy fell during COVID shutdown, but certain industries peaked and those industries, for example, uh, computers. Um, oftentimes for school aged children, you might have one computer in the home, maybe also a tablet, but then when the economy shut down and all the kids were doing uh, school remotely, everyone needed his or her own computer. So the computer industry, the chips, all that stuff shot up the webcams. Uh, those uh, companies uh, share price uh, shot up tremendously uh, during COVID. Okay, any questions? Does that make sense? So now you can answer the question, here, once you know what lag uh, is associated with the highest correlation between Costco stock and the BADI uh, indicator, now you can plot your Costco share price in the blue here. And this is the, I think it's the UMA version. Um, and then the red here, that's BADI index 
the EUMA version with the same window size. And you can almost make out when, for example, Batty goes down, when it, um, it was started high, and all of a sudden Costco went high, and then Batty went low, some period later, Costco went low. So there's absolutely um, a lag between the Batty and what happens to the Costco security. And now you can quantify it with specificity and actually identify um, how far in the future Batty um, predicts uh, what's gonna happen with Costco. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? Okay, so we'll have an exercise on Wednesday with parts of this. And in this case, uh, for this example, it was only over 90 um, reporting periods. And in this case, it was 52 days at a correlation of uh, 0.54. Uh, so that means that there's a positive relationship, 52 reporting periods ahead of time, the baddie will predict what happens with Costco. Now, this is not precise, right? Because certainly stocks oscillate um, there's a lot of uh, wiggliness, so to speak, uh, in the graph, but what they're looking for is trends. And that's one of the reasons why you do the smoothing. So you can say, I know that 54 reporting periods ahead of time, if Batty goes up, I know Costco is going to go up some amount. And people make use of that both directly with the purchase of securities or the purchase of so-called rain checks or, or, or hedging um, options uh, for securities. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? Okay, so we will have some exercises on Wednesday with parts of this, and the homework is actually going to involve a more expanded version of the types of things you've seen today. Okay. So welcome back. Um, hope you get that great cup of coffee afterwards. Um, I'm probably going to head home after a meeting, and uh, I'll see you all on Wednesday.